Well, thank you so much, uh, Don and the organizers for uh, the, it's a real honor to be participating um, in this symposium. I'm just, I got a notice on my screen. I'm gonna, um, can everybody hear me? We're fine, yep. Okay. Yeah, so I'm gonna uh, tell you the, the my, my, my foray with Mortierella uh, really began with uh, this culture here on the right. Um, I was in, in, in Rita's Vilgeli's lab and we had the opportunity to sequence uh, some genomes. We had three genomes and so we wanted to maximize phylodiversity. So we picked a basidiomyce, an ascomyce, and a zygomyce. And the reason we picked this the zygomyce is because it was common in a lot of our uh, next gen sequence data sets. It was common in the soil microbiome. And these genomes were for metatranscriptomes of forest systems. And so we thought it'd be important uh, to have this one. Now these TEMs are from uh, Kerry O'Donnell's uh, graduate studies at Michigan State University. And this last one, is a, 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 a TEM of uh, the um, bacteria living in the hyphae of this genome. So when we got this genome back, there are two genomes. We got the fungal genome and the, the bacterial genome. So we were excited, we called it uh, TUFER. So I'm gonna give a little bit of background on the ecology, the biology, and then about the, the phylodiversity of this uh, family or subphylum, if you will. Now I'm gonna, the third part's gonna talk about the bacteria, and then the fourth part's gonna talk about Mortarella plant um, interactions. So these, uh, these fungi are almost as charismatic as Kabir Sawillis in Betsy's endophytes. They're, uh, if you've cultured fungi from soil, you've most certainly come across uh, this rosette pattern of growth, which is uh, distinctive of most of the genera in this uh, family, uh, though the form of the rosette will, is dependent on the diet of the fungus. Um, there's been a lot of history on this group um, since the mid 1800s. Linnemann uh, was one uh, major, uh, made a lot of contributions looking at the uh, sporangia um, forms for differentiating a lot of the species, as well as some of the macro morphological characters and described a number of species in uh, Mortarella. Um, however, there's other genera um, in the family. And so I have to bring it back to the Farlow. And so um, this is from Roland Thaxter. You know, he, he isolated the Safra from uh, wood mouse dung uh, in Cambridge, and he, he had this culture alive for years, but during his travels in the West Indies, it died, but he still had prepared slides, and he described this new genus, uh, Dysophora. Uh, Lobosporangium is another genus in the group uh, with its um, distinctive sporangia shown here. Uh, Meredith Blackwell and Gerald Benny um, placed this in the Mortarellaceae, and um, it's only been isolated three times. So these fungi are all um, senocytic, though they can make cross walls and they often wall off old parts of their mycelial network. They're characterized by bidirectional cytoplasmic streaming. And you can see that here in this, uh, this is a genus that we described, uh, Biniella um, irionia, which, which is shown with these um, kind of chained uh, chlamydospores. Within the family, there's at least 200 species, and likely more. And the species can either be sexual, um, uh, homothallic, or heterothallic. So they can, some of them can self, and others need to outcross. And uh, you know, following up on Matt, here's one of Matt's um, um, interesting finds in South America. This is Moticella reniformis, which is a, a sporocarpic uh, Mortarellaceae fungus. Um, known only from South America, that species. We have a species in North America and there's a third in uh, New Zealand. So about the ecology of Mortarellaceae, it's still really understood. You know, uh, Peter gave a good overview that they might uh, you know, be implicated in uh, kind of necromass turnover in soils. 
um, for sure, Borrelaceae are a core part of the soil microbiome. Um, nutritionally, they can use, utilize simple sugars. Uh, they are very good at utilizing chitin in their genome and, and protein, their genomes are enriched in protease uh, enzymes. Uh, a number of, of the groups have been shown to be endophytes in plants and in some cases can promote uh, plant growth. And these are industrial fungi. They're used uh, in lipid production commercially. So um, my first PhD, the first PhD student in my lab, uh, Natalie Vandepol, uh, recently published this work, um, which used phylogenomics and, and a combination of phylogenomics and multi-gene phylogenetics to try to resolve um, what was known as Mortirella, the genus, which was a polyphyletic genus. Um, and so we used monophyly as a, a way to try to uh, describe these different genera. Uh, so we can um, better ascertain maybe what their ecology is and their distribution. So um, we used the uh, low coverage genome sequencing of 70 taxa to uh, have a highly resolved tree, which we then expanded with the use of uh, multi-gene phylogenetics with uh, six loci. So we kind of had this super tree approach. We constrained the uh, backbone. And so you see up top, here's Biniella, the sister group of Moticella. Here's the Sophora, which is um, related to Gamziella. And uh, here comes Lobosporangium out on a branch. Um, Mortirella uh, alpina group, polycephala is the type species, so that we retained uh, the genus Mortirella for the alpina clade. Uh, Linamania is what we would call uh, Mortirella elongata, so a lot of my talk is now talk, I'll, I'll use the new name Linamania. And uh, Podella in orange is another uh, plant associated group. So Podella, Mortirella, and Linamania are often uh, isolated in, from plant rhizospheres. Um, now, Mortirellaceae are known to associate with bacteria. In fact, nearly 20% of isolates will harbor bacteria, either external or internal. And so here is a kind of a, a little bit of a meta-analysis that combines data from our lab with those from Alishka Okrasinska and, uh, and Takashima, who recently published on, on these uh, endobacteria. So in blue, paraburcaldaria, these are kind of facultative endobacteria um, associated with the hyphoplane. Um, they're in mucor, umbilopsis, and borterlaceae. Uh, Teresa Palowska talked about rhizopus and their bacteria. These are in pink here, mycetohabitans. Um, and those are, those are endobacteria. And the AMF in green here is shown uh, Candidatus glomerobacter. These are in the Gigosporaceae, Gigospora and Scutellospora. And then in red are those bacteria that I'll be uh, talking about, uh, Burkholderia related. These are uh, Mycoavidus, um, and there's three main uh, clades of that. You know, we might call them species, but they're, they're actually quite diverse. Um, so how do you know they're endobacteria? To, to really uh, demonstrate this, um, transmission electron microscopy or, uh, or fish are used uh, to confirm this. Um, and so here's, uh, here's two different groups that we show uh, from Alessandro DeZero's um, uh, work. And then uh, fish is shown here from the Takashima and all paper in 2018 showing these bacteria um, inside the hyphae and uh, inside sporangia spores. So we've gotten a number of genomes back and if we take their genes out and align the orthologous genes, then we can look at a kind of presence absence. And this is a, kind of a little bit of a crude way to look at it, but what, what's fascinating to me um, so the first one here, Mycoavidus species three, this one actually appears to promote the growth of the host. So when the host has this bacterium, it grows a bit faster. The two below it, uh, one of those is from um, Linamania elongata in North Carolina, 
The other one is from Linamania elongata, same host, but isolated from Japan. And so here we have the endosymbiont of the fungus. And if you look at it, it's, they're not completely the same, but wow, there's, there's, there, there really is a lot of conservation here, which to me is, is kind of amazing. Um, we haven't detected any plasmids. Their genomes are kind of small, two and a half to 2.8 megabases. Uh, with a, a little over 2,000 uh, genes. We've been able to use some associative mapping techniques similar to what's used in GWAS to look at genes under positive selection in these, in these bacteria. And uh, there's not a lot. We had a short list, but of those that we found, um, they tend to be involved in energy and amino acid metabolism. Um, I, I should say uh, a lot of them are amino acid oxytrophs, like for instance, to, to, to grow them, uh, you have to supplement with cysteine um, and, 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 and other metabolites. So there's a, a second group of endobacteria that I want to talk about. These are the molecule related endobacteria. And this was a, 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 a passion of Alessandro De Zero, who, who came to work in my lab as a postdoc. He had uh, worked with Paolo Bonfante and characterized MRE in our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and, and then he discovered them in endogony, which is an ectomycorrhizal fungi uh, in the endogonales. And so he was really wanted to know, uh, are they in Morturilaceae as well? And in fact, he was able to demonstrate that they are um, only in 3% of our cultures. So we went through hundreds of cultures, but he found them in nearly every um, clade at the time, which would, we would call a genus now. And there were three main groups of these endo um, bacteria molecules related. It has these beautiful uh, SEM done in Robbie Robertson's lab where you can, you can actually see the cells dividing. So they are active. Um, actively growing in these fungi. We've been generating some genomes from these. Um, these are very hard to work with because they are so uh, divergent from each other. Uh, but they do have a, there is a clade that is fungal specific. So this is work of uh, Julian Lieber, um, where, where we're looking at, we're doing a kind of a comparative approach based on these orthologs. Uh, but the challenge is a lot of these are just hypothetical proteins. We just got the um, our, uh, uh, UNITIG last week of the smallest genome yet of one of these MRE it was 326 kilobases. Um, there's between 1100 to 1400 genes in these bacteria. Um, they can have plasmids. And, uh, and one isolate has a, a mitovirus in it as well. If you look at what they are, really they're, um, what's, what, what we know about the, the genes that are there is a, a large part of the genomes involved in translation, replication, repair, and protein metabolism. So uh, the question of course arises, what is their impact on the host? And so we've looked at this in a number of different ways. Uh, Jesse Euling published um, uh, early on, or a few years back anyways, showing that when you remove these bacteria, uh, the, the fungus is a little bit relieved and it grows more fluffy, you get more biomass. Um, and so that was in the BREs. Uh, we see the same patterns, uh, it, it was, and it's not for all BREs. As I mentioned, there's one uh, group that seems to promote the, the fungal host growth. If we look at uh, MREs, we see a similar pattern where, um, well, actually, we see that uh, Morturella, um, this species here, uh, which is uh, Alpina, it actually grows uh, faster, more biomass at four degrees than at 22 degrees. And what we see here is it's only at room temperature that there's a change, a statistically difference, uh, difference in their growth rate. And we use qPCR to demonstrate that that's because at this room temperature range, the bacterial population is much higher. So at these low, um, low temperature, high temperature, the bacteria don't really, uh, they're not as active within the mycelium. So following up on this, 
uh, in collaboration with Powell uh, Mitchdahl, we were able to put these isolates uh, cured um, or not. So we use antibiotics to remove the bacteria, cured or not in these chambers for real time, um, time resolved um, emission analysis. And here's an, just a kind of a cool example because here we have them and we're ramping up the temperature in the incubator um, every few hours. So at 20 degrees, you can see, uh, I'm just showing one example here. This is butyric acid, which is a known um, uh, metabolite from mycoplasmas. And so as you ramp up the temperatures, uh, the activity of these bacteria goes uh, kind of off the charts here, especially at 30 degrees. We didn't go up to 37, but that that um, um, they would probably uh, you you'd lose that signal. How about the fungal metabolome? So this is this is using metabolomics. This is an S plot um, that is that is looking at um, how you can discriminate cured from wild type isolates. So the cured here is in red, and these are the metabolites that can discriminate the two isolates, and they're largely uh, when there's no bacterium, um, you largely get a lot more acidic polyunsaturated phospholipids. Uh, when the bacterium's there, there's a there's a drastic change in the metabolism. So it's it's not just a few metabolites being broken down. There's a huge shift in the fungal uh, metabolism, um, with stearic acid being uh, particularly abundant in. MRE infected isolates, as well as polyunsaturated uh, phospholipids. Most of these metabolites are not well characterized. So uh, how about mating? So it's been shown, uh, Teresa yesterday showed that with mycetohabitins that they are required for mating um, in rhizopus. We see the opposite here for our Burkholderia related um, um, endobacteria. So if they're present, it suppresses, it prevents mating in Morturella. And so this is, we showed this in a hetero, um, heterothallic species, Linomania elongata. Uh, Takashima showed this last year, they published it in a homothallic fungus where it was sterile until they um, cleared the bacteria out with antibiotics, and then they got um, zygospore production. So that, that was kind of cool. And it showed this, this same thing that, that our work was showing. On the other hand, MRE uh, do not have any impact on, um, on, on preventing um, sexual reproduction. And they are most definitely uh, you know, thought to be vertically transmitted. Um, so this third section, I'm going to talk about some of these interactions of Morturella with plants. Um, this is work here. I'm going to highlight from uh, uh, Davis Matthew, who's interested in um, uh, Fiscomitrium patens um, and its impact on uh, how Morturella interacts with the moss and how the bacteria uh, is, and if there's a role of the bacteria in this interaction. And I'm just going to you know, tell you that there's not. Uh, we didn't see any impact of the MRE or BRE on the host response. However, um, we did see differential uh, effects of the different fungi on the host. And so uh, Biniella um, is, is, is had more of a parasitic response on the plant. So this is based on plant genes, uh, you know, that were, uh, Overly expressed uh, or significant dif significant significant differences in uh, stress response, immune response, apoptosis, where Linomania elongata seemed to be more of a, a mutualist or a friendly interaction uh, with uh, DEGs involved in carbon uh, metabolism, nitrogen uh, growth development, and uh, decrease in um, stress. This is, uh, we wanted to see about with flowering plants. So this is work that uh, Natalie Van, Van de Poel did uh, with Arabidopsis in, uh, in, in Morturella. Um, so from the same uh, soil sample, we isolated two fungi. One of them, uh, uh, the same species, one carried MRE, the other carried uh, BRE. And uh, what she showed here was there is a phenotype in the seed uh, mass and the total seed number um, of, 
uh, those organ those plants grown with mortuarella. We had been using millet and uninoculated, you know, millet not inoculated and um, and no millet, and as a, as these two different types of controls. Um, we were concerned that millet might, it can be allelopathic, it can also be a nitrogen sink. So she moved to these um, uh, plate assays. And so there's no millet um, um, confounding factor. And what we see is there's a, there's a significant impact. So these are colonized, these are not colonized negative control. The aerial biomass um, is significantly improved. Uh, but again, similar to what Davis found is we didn't see any impact uh, on the um, endobacteria. And so how does it affect the aerial plant growth? She did RNA-seq experiments and looked at some of these genes and it, and it appears to be um, involved something with plant hormones, modifying auxin, ethylene, and, uh, and ROS response pathways. And my, my final uh, little vignette, I'm gonna talk about how Mortuarella interacts with microalgae. And this is work uh, that was done by a, a postdoc in my lab, uh, um, Ziyan Du, who's now a professor uh, uh, in, in Hawaii. And uh, they worked at my lab, uh, the lab next to mine worked with microalgae. And, um, we'd known that uh, flocculation is a big thing. So we wanted to see if uh, Mortarella could help um, bioflocculate these microalgae. And uh, sure enough, we found that, um, that some groups did, uh, especially the Linemania clade was very effective. And you can see these hyphae uh, kind of turn green when you put them in a, in a jar with, um, with, uh, with these algae, um, they flocculate to the fungal mycelium. Not only that is, uh, this, this is kind of cool. Cl Chlamydomonas has flagella, so it actually swims uh, very quickly uh, to, the, uh, to the fungus mycelium when, it's, when, it's, uh, when they're put together. And they form this kind of biofilm uh, together and it's a protective matrix. So we did this experiment with the oxidation where we put bleach on the fungi and immediately if there's no, if, um, if it's just the algae, they bleach in a second. Uh, but if they're grown in this biofilm, uh, they, they, uh, they don't bleach and they persist for, uh, for days, um, still active in photosynthesizing. Um, what's the role of bacteria on this flocculation? Uh, we didn't publish this because this was really, um, it, it, we, our, our results were different. We come in, they look green, they're flocculating. We come in the next day and they'd be white, they bleach out, and then sometimes they turn green again. Um, we, we did look into it and it appears that with the endobacteria, there's a, there's a higher uh, ROS content. Um, there's a, a, a lower viability of the algal cells, less chlor chloroplast. So we think there's a negative response of the endobacteria, but uh, the challenge is, is we have to monitor, we need to use qPCR so we know what the endobacteria population is uh, throughout these studies. Um, if you just grow nanochloropsis alone, it has a smooth cellular surface. But if you grow it in the presence of a fungus, that outer surface uh, is removed and it has these, these irregular tube-like extensions that actually make contact uh, with the fungal cell wall. And so here you can see the cells all around flocculating all around. They stick to the uh, mycelium. Um, we did some carbon tracing uh, studies with uh, C14 where we labeled the algae um, and, and then put them with the fungus. And we, were, and we did this in a couple different ways. We had a no contact control where there was a membrane between them that, that solutions could um, um, move between. We also used heat killed cells. So we weren't lysing the cells but we would, we would kill them so they're not living. And it turns out uh, that the, the signal is pretty strong in those cells that directly interact and they have to be alive. And the heat, heat killed cells, those were put in the vial too. So what this means is this is a biotrophic interaction. It's not a so saprotrophic um, um, DK uh, kind of interaction going on. We did a similar thing with nitrogen where we're able to show 
that nitrogens um, move in both ways between the partner. Uh, it looks like a little bit more is moving to the algae than to the fungus. In here, uh, we didn't see that uh, contact was necessary um, for this exchange. So this is kind of uh, the coolest thing uh, to me was the, uh, this long-term effect of co-cultivation. When carbon is limited, uh, these algae can become internalized uh, within Mortuella hyphae um, and, and they can persist for months in this condition. Um, whether these uh, fungal cells are still, um, I don't know how much cytoplasmic streaming is going in when they become chock full of algae like this, um, but the colonies are alive. And we have some nice TEM that kind of show this, this condition. So here's the, the fungal cell wall uh, showing, uh, you know, continuous. And these are the algae uh, actually living inside the fungi. And you can see their chloroplasts are large, they're healthy, they're happy. And here you can see the, the fungal mycelium has, has cytoplasm. So it is, uh, this, this one's alive at this, you know, the time of sectioning. And as far as I know, I'm not aware of any fungi um, ever really taking up algae or being shown to do so. So in conclusion, there's, a, there's a now a 13 um, reference genera in Mortuary ACE. Um, these fungi, all of the genera can host bacteria and they're, they're fairly common. And, um, and so this kind of evidence supports this idea of an early invasion. So uh, the fact that the, these clades, both BRE and MRE are in our muscular mycorrhizal, the glomer micotina, leucor micotina and mortarella micotina, uh, we suspect so it was an early invasion. Um, let's see, BRE but MRE um, uh, inhibit mortarella mating. Um, Linamania appears to interact with vascular and non-vascular plants uh, kind of as a, as a mutualist and it might be a biotroph association with algae, um, but these interactions aren't affected by the bacteria. So with that, I wanna thank folks in my lab um, who, who did this work, other collaborators, uh, the Zygo Life uh, Consortium and, um, and JGI for helping with a lot of this sequencing. Thank you.